We'll head now, as already mentioned by Dr. Sylvia Mukandawire, to the next session, which is a panel discussion on the RSIF sandwich model. The RSIF is engineered as a sandwich model that allows scholars to spend a part of their PhD time abroad in uh, a university abroad or a research institution to carry out their research. So to uh, give us uh, leadership and moderation for this session. Uh, we have uh, Professor Andres uh, Kotsi. I hope I got that pronunciation correct. Um, and he is the director of the African Studies Center at the University of Michigan. And, uh, 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 and in that capacity, he oversees the strategic partnership between University of Michigan and partner institutions in Africa. He's a professor of linguistics, and uh, his research focuses on complex linguistic landscape of the post-apartheid uh, South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Andres Kotsi. Thank you very much, Bonface, for that introduction. So good morning to everybody joining us from the US and good afternoon if you're in Africa or Europe. And I know we also have some participants from Asia. So good evening to, to all of them. And um, welcome to this panel discussion. As we heard, we will be focusing here on the PASET RSIF sandwich program. Um, and as I was just introduced, I am Andres Kutsia. I am a professor here at University of Michigan. Um, although I started my both my education and my academic career at a small regional university in South Africa. So I have experience of the educational systems in both South Africa and the United States. And I know how much these dual experiences have enriched both my professional and my personal lives. Um, and as Bonface mentioned, here at the University of Michigan, I'm currently serving as the director of the African Studies Center. And in that capacity, we work very closely with the PASED team, Dr. Osiro and Dr. Nyaga and so on. And in fact, we just very recently became the first international, the most recent newest international partner institution for the RSIF program. And we're looking forward very much to within the next year or so welcome the first RSIF students to, to our campus. So let's do a, a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, here's the plan for how our panel discussion will go today. We'll start out with each of our panelists doing a short four to five minute presentation, focusing on their engagement or involvement with the PASET RSIF program, or more broadly with the higher education landscape in Africa and specifically with academic mobility in that landscape. Um, and then there'll be some um, moderated discussion between our panelists. And at the end, we will allow some time for Q and A from our audience. The Q&A function is available in Zoom. It should be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So I ask that you post any questions you have in there. You can start posting any moment. So as the presentations go on and any question comes up, feel free to put it in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of the questions as there is time for closer towards the end of, of our panel today. We are really fortunate to today for our panel have together a collection of panelists who can bring a lot of experience about the PASET RSIF program, or more generally about the African higher education system and mobility within that system. Um, they come at this from many very, very different backgrounds, many different experiences playing different parts in this program. And therefore, I think they can provide us really good insights from the ground, so to speak, about what in this program is working well, what perhaps might not be working well. So what are the strengths? What are some of the potential shortcomings? And together we can think about how to make this kind of program as successful as possible. So rather than me going into lengthy introductions of each of our panelists um, and taking up you know, a lot of the time that we have available together, I think what I will rather do is just briefly introduce each of our panelists before they do their presentation, and then they can add whatever additional information about their background that might be necessary. Um, so for the opening statements, we'll go as follows. We will start with uh, 
a current RSIF student who can give us some background about the experience of being in this program. Then we will hear from some of our participating universities, both African host universities and then the international partner institution to, to get the perspective of, of both sides um, in this collaboration. But then we'll also get some input from industry partners because RSIF scholars, RFF students can also do their sandwich experience um, at, uh, in industry. They're not all necessarily in universities. And then at the end, we will end with a presentation from somebody working in the foundation space who has also a lot of experience in the higher education landscape in Africa and can give a, a broader perspective on these kinds of academic um, um, mobility programs. So without further delay, um, let us... Um, get into our presentations. Let me just see, I see there's a question on the chat function. Oh, okay, yeah, so reminding me that there's a poll that we need to run at some point during the presentation. I hope I'll remember if I forget, um, please remind me again. But okay, let's get into our panel presentations then. And our first presentation is by Ms. Sylvia Maina. Um, Ms. Maina, is an RSIF PhD student. Um, she's a student at Sokoina University of Agriculture in Tanzania. And then she's currently doing her sandwich experience as part of the RSIF program at the Korea Institute of Science and Technology. Her interests is um, in solving human health issues related to food security. And her research focus in particular is on determining the potential health benefits of underutilized African leafy vegetables. So Ms. Maina, over to you. I think you can share your screen to show us your presentation. Okay. Um, okay. So welcome to my presentation. And um, I'll be presenting as one of the cohort one scholars who joined the RSIF uh, scholarship. So I was enrolled at Sokoini University of Agriculture and uh, under the thematic area of food security and agribusiness. And I spent my first 17 months taking the mandatory lectures and the trainings for PhD scholars. And in the meantime, I was also uh, supposed to develop my research proposal, defend it and get examined. And successfully, I managed to go through and uh, we established a research Partner Institute, which is the Convergence Smart Farm uh, Research Institute at Kist Korea. And uh, through, through that, I am working now on my current research, which is uh, trying to understand how often African leafy vegetables can be utilized in promoting human health. So uh, after joining Kist, uh, although I I was forced to modify my research objectives, of course, to align to something that I can achieve in the laboratory I'm currently attached to. Uh, I must say that I have been able to receive quite a wide range of technical skills and training. And I've also been able to perform my analysis, that is my research, as well as report and make publications from the results. And my position is an RS RSIS scholar. And as a research trainee at KIST also opened um, opportunities for me to uh, apply and get a scholarship, a grant through the Samsung uh, Global Scholarship Program. So, um, my experience in Korea have been majorly on uh, the culture 
and uh, the culture here at KIST is work oriented and uh, highly focused on the on the kind of work they perform and disciplined, well uh, uh, integrated and engaging into activities that allow uh, uh, what we can call good and uh, results that you can uh, back up or easily uh, talk about. So another thing about the culture here is it's well ordered and structured with the respect of peers in the work they do. There's thorough supervision that is very closely monitored by my supervisor, requiring me as a trainee to schedule regular meetings and presentations in the work and the uh, results I obtain almost uh, twice, uh, twice a month or so. And uh, the culture here also ensures that there's consciousness of researcher safety and health. And uh, this is not only in our, not only in our laboratories or where we work, but also in our areas of accommodation. And uh, if I may talk of the laboratories, we have to, uh, or as a person, I have to take regular safety trainings, of course, with examinations and uh, certifications to get into the lab and to perform my analysis. In terms of health, I have to undergo several checkups, usually semi-annually, and uh, this may be special depending on the kind of uh, equipment or kind of uh, chemicals I'm using. And uh, the culture, the work culture here also ensures that the research data is very much encrypted and uh, data security is uh, looked upon very much. I cannot get anything from a research machine using my memory stick or using my external hard disk at uh, any point. The benefits of uh, this uh, sandwich program, uh, it has made me get access to the best and among the top flag scientists and experts in the field. And uh, this has exposed me to current trends in uh, methods in handling equipment as well as facilities in the lab. I have also received uh, strong support for research in terms of the way I have been designing my research and uh, formulating my objectives. Uh, I've also been able to undergo or maintain the ethical standards of research and have certifications that allow me to uh, perform specific experiments. And uh, the support I have also received includes communicating my research to the right audience and making quality publications and reporting my uh, research outputs uh, in the right way. Uh, in KIST, I've also received financial support in terms of the research uh, objectives I've been performing. And I'm not uh, supposed to pay any bench fee or buy any, uh, cater for cost of buying any of the materials that I need to use. Uh, another benefit includes networking with uh, not only members of the Institute, but also members who have networked with for instance, my PI and uh, my colleagues. And mentorship has also been a benefit for me uh, while at KIST. One other thing includes uh, having to have had other opportunities in activities like team research projects, uh, having been trained not only by my uh, team or colleagues, but also getting experts from companies uh, to come and train us maybe on uh, using a particular machine or using a particular equipment. And also um, uh, having uh, the Korean language for the purpose of uh, maybe communication and integrating into mm -hmm. the community. Sylvia, you need so the, to be wrapping up so that we can stick to our time schedule, sorry. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, the challenges, uh, uh, while here have been one of the major challenge, of course, is the language barrier. Uh, taking note that most of the communications and presentations are made uh, in Korean language. 
And another challenge includes the concerns of uh, what next, what next upon returning back to uh, my home uh, institute or uh, my home country. I am at risk of not using the skills I acquired considering the level of, um, of equipment or facilities I used here is not similar to what I had there. And uh, another challenge uh, was the duration of the study. It was quite uh, not so uh, okay for us, having considering that we needed to learn or get to know our supervisors first and learn what they require as well as perform quality and uh, valuable research. So I would recommend from uh, these uh, experiences that anyone willing or uh, wishing to come to Korea for their research, they need to have remedial uh, language training prior or while still performing um, their research here in Korea. They also need to put uh, upgraded equipment and facilities in our host countries and laboratories so that what we get here, we can take back and uh, perform more analysis without having to risk um, the skills we acquired. And lastly, there's need to emphasize on future collaborative research, not only with our African Host Institute, but also with um, the faculties where, for instance, I came from. So that uh, if I need to go back to my faculty, I can have, uh, I can perform research uh, with my supervisors or with the research team that I left uh, at KIST. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Maina. Um, that is a great opportunity for um, everybody in the audience to get a perspective of what it is like to be a student participating in this program. Um, so next, let's move to Professor Maisa Mbaye, who is here as a representative of one of the African host universities who participate in the RSIF program. Professor Mbaye is affiliated with the Gaston Berger University in Senegal, um, where he is also um, the lead for the African Center of Excellence in Mathematics, Computer Science, and ICT. He completed his PhD in 2009 from Bordeaux One University in Computer Science. And as I've mentioned, Gaston, Gaston Berger is one of the African host universities in the RSIF program. And Professor Mbaye can therefore bring a valuable perspective from that side of the equation. Um, I should maybe mention for the audience, if, if any of the presentations are in a language that you are less comfortable with in the right-hand corner, you can click to select either English, French, or Portuguese interpretation. Professor Mbaye, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I will do my presentation in French and thank you for introducing me. Um, bonjour à, à tout le monde. Donc, uh, mon nom est uh, Maïsan Baye. My name is uh, Maïsan Baye. I am uh, I'm a, a, a professor at the University of Gaston Berger de Saint-Louis, which, which is part of the African host universities, which receive uh, uh, scholars under the program uh, uh, receive. I'm involved in this uh, this receive program in three different ways. First, I am director of the thèse de la première cohorte qui a été recrutée en 2017 et qui ont terminé leur leur programme sandwich ce mois. Deuxièmement, j'ai je suis le le point focal par cette the focal point. Uh, and lastly, I'm the coordinator of the Center of Excellence, which also receives scholars. Just to say at what, at, at what point I'm involved in this uh, the PASET project and uh, RESIF PASET project, uh, University Gaston Berger is a university which is in Senegal, northern part of Senegal, which has been uh, receiving uh, scholars since the first cohort. It's, uh, the, the third uh, cohort is uh, 
is uh, is uh, registering, and the the fourth cohort is uh, uh, going to be selected. So we collaborate uh, with WPI in the United with uh, in the United States, uh, and then uh, in Mohammed Sis. Uh, the two students we had in WPI have just finished their their sandwich program, uh, and then this are. This uh, enables us to move forward. And for the, to just to end on this password, I would say that this uh, scholarship program it's actually an innovation, innovation because it's the first time that uh, African governments are uh, over. Um, um, actually offering Africa uh, African universities. Uh, to train uh, PhD students in collaboration with uh, international uh, partner institutions uh, of research. Uh, and these uh, in, uh, universities are actually doing a great job. So I'm going to stop there. So I will come back uh, so that I can be able to answer questions relating to, to my presentation and to this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Mbaye. Um, so next, let's move on to somebody who is a representative from an international partner institution. So to also give us the, um, the perspective from that side of the collaboration. And for this, we are moving to Professor Abdel Ghani Chebouni. Um, who is from the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco, one of the international partner institutions in the PASET RSIF program. Um, at Mohammed VI, Professor Chobuni um, is the lead of the Center for Remote Sensing Application and also for the International Water Research Institute. Professor Chabuni has a PhD in hydrology and remote sensing from the University of Toulouse, jointly also with the University of Arizona in the United States. He's a very well published researcher and also very experienced as a PhD advisor. He's advised more than 25 students on PhDs. So he brings a lot of experience and background in advising and supporting students. Um, Professor Chabuni, over to you. We would like to hear from you. Um, is Professor Chibuni with us? Don't currently see him on the list of panelists, so maybe he has not been able to um, to log on yet. Well, so that we can move forward. I think we can move on to our next panelist and then if Professor, oh, there I see Professor um, Chabuni are, are now on the list. Are, are you here and available to make your presentation? I think that Professor Chabuni might be having technical problems. So let's move on to our next um, presenter and we can come back to Professor Chabuni if um, you know um, he can join us later. So next we can change focus a little bit and go from academic institutions to industry partners. Um, the um, PASIT RSIF program allows students to not only spend their sandwich program at other academic institutions, but also allows for them to have opportunities working in industry. And we are therefore also very fortunate to have some partners bringing this um, perspective to this interaction. And here I want to um, introduce two of my fellow countrymen from South Africa, Donovan Hutton and Athol Swanepoel, both of whom are affiliated with Nestle in South Africa. Donovan Hutton is a manufacturing excellent excellence expert. He has more than 25 years experience with Nestle and he has expertise in areas such as industrial engineering, 
performance improvement, business planning and operations management, management to mention just a few. And then Athol Swanepoel is the head of human resources for Nestle East and Southern Africa. And he brings more than 20 years of experience in the HR domain to the table with expertise in areas such as talent management and development, learning and development, employee relationships, um, organizational development, change management, and many more. So, um, Mr. Hutton, Mr. Schwanepoel, um, over to you. Andres, very, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, I think also to the previous speakers, it's it's been really very interesting listening to you and uh, to Ms. Maena, you know, your experience, I think that was, was quite important. So as you've said, I head up um, human resources for Nestle within the East and Southern Africa region. So spanning all the way from, you know, Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia, down the East Coast, um, you know, with uh, countries like uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and so forth, and of course, also covering uh, Tanzania. Um, so all in all, uh, we've got a footprint of about 23 countries. Um, I think Nestle is a, you know, well-established and, and known multinational organization. Um, and uh, the reason we're here is, is that, you know, for Nestle, people development is, is quite an important priority. It uh, underpins not only, you know, how we look at our employees internally, but also in, you know, forming partnerships with, uh, with others ac across industry, um, as, as, you know, is evidenced in this instance. Um, and certainly, you know, we're looking forward to this partnership with the RSIF um, and in supporting, uh, you know, one of the students that will be joining us in providing, you know, sort of assistance with the placement and giving them the right sort of experiences. Thank you, Andres. Thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting to, to hear and to see the collaboration also with um, industry. And, I, and that we will talk more about that because I think that's a really important part of this. So next we move on to our next panelist who is also coming to us from the industry angle. And this is Mr. Kazuo Sasaki who is the CEO of Challenge in Japan. Mr. Sasaki, is a seasoned engineering and management specialist. Um, he founded in 2009 Challenge Company in Japan. And this is a company that provides innovative projects, products for security and disaster prevention. And one of their main focuses is on earthquake detection and warning systems. Under the Passit Umbrella um, Challenge Company in Japan, has been working together with the University of Ghana to also build um, capacity in this area in West Africa. Mr. Sasaki, over to you for your presentation.
Yes, we can see the slides. Thank you. Anna University. And at the first uh, 40 gigahertz, uh, I will show you one minute video. Natural disasters have drastically impacted many people's lives around the world. Due to geographical reasons, earthquakes and tsunamis occur especially frequently in Japan. Introducing EQ Guard, an earthquake sensor alarm device which was designed to save people from earthquakes and tsunamis. The EQ Guard can react to near epicenter earthquakes that occur suddenly. The alarm is available in 11 different languages and it displays the seismic intensity of various places on a real time map. It is also able to distinguish 0.1 gal of noise, so it can distinguish between actual earthquakes and other vibrations, preventing false alarms. EQ Guard has a sensor which detects the initial small vibrations of an earthquake and issues an alarm immediately before any significant tremors occur, allowing people to evacuate safely. It can function as a standalone device or connect to other units to create a regional network. It can also be used as a shutdown system at chemical plants and train stations. EQ Guard aims to save lives around the world from earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, so, uh, we are a maker of disaster and security related products as well as systems. One of the main products is EQ Guard. Uh, uh, this is, I have a EQ Guard. This is EQ Guard. EQ Guard sensor inside and it detects small initial vibration and issue alarm immediately before a big shaking arrives so people can evacuate safely. Uh, so, and, and also, Ikigata can be conducted evacuation drill. So Ikigata can save people from earthquake. Uh, this is our activity in Ghana. Uh, installation. Collaboration with GGSA and NADMO, uh, Ghana government. And we installed in at present, present House, National Parliament, Government, Ghana University together. And we also conducted eviction drill with Ghana University. Uh, we conduct eviction drill at government, NADMO, and Ghana University Elementary School, Weijia Village. This is a picture of eviction drill in Weijia Village. Uh, 100 people joined. And uh, so they, uh, they got uh, how to evacuate very successfully, very nicely. And this is a newspaper article. And future plan, uh, first collaboration with Ghana University. We will disseminate eviction drill nationwide, all over the Ghana. And uh, we develop eviction drill uh, make, we make a manual for eviction drill, and we develop eviction drill leaders, uh, teachers, and the students will become leaders. And the second, other opportunities, first, manufacturing, installation, and maintenance. Uh, Ghana Friend will assemble Ikigad, made in uh, made in Ghana, and uh, installation, maintenance. 
We do training of workers, transfer of technology, employment creation. And second, data analysis and utilization. This is a, a seismometers classification. Uh, there are many categories, A to L. So category F uh, is early earthquake warning device, uh, EQ guard. And the smart community and the seismometer data usage. Seismometer data use H include land use, structural design, emergency responses, and evacuation. Uh, there are many themes to be solved. So let's proceed together. We are glad to cooperate with Ghana and with you. So please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sazaki. Those um, images of the evacuation drills took me back to high school when we did similar drills, except I don't think they were as well organized. It was probably a bit more chaotic when, when we did them. Um, but very important work. Um, let me just confirm, is Professor Chabuni with us? Has he been able to join us? Yes, sir, with you. Yes. I will, I will put my camera. Yeah. Thank you. We're very happy to have you here. So I briefly introduced you earlier. Um, I will not do so again now. We're very glad that you can join us and would love to hear your perspective as you know, somebody who's a representative of an international partner institution as part of the PASET RSIF program. So um, over to you. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate being part of, of, of the overall initiative and, and listen, listening to all the interesting talk that took place during the entire day. I think that I would like to make two or three points. Uh, the, our ambition in this program is to form or to educate future leader in Africa that, that, that will be able to tackle the issue of the development, the overall development in Africa, technology, social economy, et cetera, et cetera. But I would like to emphasize one very important point is, yeah, I mean, the, the era where the knowers impose their their vision to the to the rest of the population is over i think within this training process we have to train our students to listen to the to, to the end user because no one has the magic solution the solution for real world problem has to be co-built by the end user because for the past 50 years i mean i have been involved in international cooperation for a long time you know the algorithm of you know working on on in their office the scientists and come up to the policy maker and to the end user telling them this is the solution that you need it doesn't work and it will not work so we have i mean there is for the, for the past couple of years there is this notion of sustainability science that i truly believe that this is the path to go if we want to to solve the real world problem and and making taking advantage of you know traditional know-how cultural aspects you know in in you know, collective intelligence this is very important to me thank you Thank you very much. Um, those are indeed very important points uh, about the importance of collaboratively solving these problems and working also with traditional knowledge and cultural knowledge. Um, so our last panelist 
is Andrea Johnson. Um, Ms. Johnson has deep experience in the philanthropy and foundation world and in the higher education world in the African context. Um, she's currently the program officer for higher education and research in Africa from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And in this capacity, she oversees many things, but amongst them, the strategy for the um, corporation and more generally for the continent to develop and retain a new generation of African academics. So something that is really very well aligned with the goals of the PASET RSIF program. Um, she has a long and interesting career in foundations and philanthropy, including both work in the US, in South America, and for many years in Africa. Ms. Johnson, we are looking forward to um, get your perspective on the issues addressed by our other panelists. I think with your background and expertise and experience in this domain, you can give a, a, a nice framing for the issues that, that we have to deal with here. Okay. Thank you, um, Andres, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this session. And I send greetings to everyone. Uh, as Andres said, my, my work at Carnegie Corporation focuses on what we grandly term developing and retaining the next generation of African academics. So that makes the theme of this panel quite close to my heart. I'd like to raise two points. Interestingly enough, uh, they touch on things that uh, the future Dr. Maina raised in her own presentation at the beginning of the session. First, we should remember that doctoral training serves a socialization process as well as a means of building research skills. Doctoral students not only learn research skills but also become socialized into the research culture of their discipline and the research culture of the context in which they do their training. Sandwich program for research cultures. that of their home institution and that of their sandwich placement insights, but it can also breed discontent. Second, I want to emphasize the often overlooked retention imperative. We include retention of early career researchers in African institutions as a stated objective of our strategy. And as a funder, I review potential projects with that objective in mind. If the unit of analysis is the individual student, sandwich programs normally will provide unquestioned benefits. However, if the unit of analysis is the African research institution or the broader national or regional research system, how can sandwich programs be designed to best contribute to the retention of graduates in African institutions so the graduates can make longer term contributions in their home countries? Thank you again and over to you, Andres. Thank you very much. So um, let me remind our audience members that you can use the Q&A function in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So at any point, feel free to pose questions to any of our panelists or to all of us together. But next, let's go into a little bit of a structured conversation between the panelists. So I have a couple of questions that I will pose to our panelists. Some of them are directed at specific panelists, but in general, I invite kind of all of our panelists to, you know, unmute, switch on your camera if you feel, you know, it's a question that you have something to say about, to contribute about, or if you want to respond to something what somebody else have said. But um, let me begin by putting a question to Professor Chabuni as a representative of an international partner institution that works with the PASET RSIF program. And I'm speaking here a little bit selfishly, um, also as somebody who works at, a, at an institution who, you know, we just became a partner institution for the PASET RSIF program. But thinking more generally of other institutions that might want to partner. Um, it's easier to imagine the benefit for the African host institutions from participating in a program like this. But if we as international partners want to participate in this, we have to convince the authorities at our home universities why it is important for us to engage in programs like this. So how does one do that? How does one convince the vice chancellor of your university that 
there is benefit for us as international partner institutions to participate in programs like this yes i mean uh, i mean the, the beauty of this program it is win win situation as, as you said that the the university the, uh, from which uh, the, the student or the candidate is uh, uh, the origin of the candidate uh, the candidate uh, university i mean has in uh, i mean obvious interests, but from the other side, I think that there are several, several points that can be pointed out. The, the, the first one is promoting the diversity within, within the, the core of, of student. The second, this is, and this is what I, I'm, I'm hoping in, in the framework of this program is it is not only about exchanging the, the students, but also seeking the opportunity of establishing a research program with the, the origin university. This will help in, in, in uh, enhancing the network of host university. And uh, I mean, you know that all international university want to be more and more international. <laughs> I mean, and how this can be done? It can be done by by getting a maximum foreign uh, foreign student as possible, the good one, the preference, and also to extend their network with uh, research and cooperation relationship with universities throughout Africa. And this is the interest. Um, that all rings very true to me, right? If I think about the experience that we have at the University of Michigan, um, there's a drive to increase the diversity of our students. And um, we are a very international institution with a large proportion of international students, but we have an underrepresentation of students from Africa. So that's a yeah. real benefit to our campus, right? To just bring those voices to our campus. And um, to go over, I mean, you know, at at university level, it's it's very clear that that uh, that they have interests of hosting students, especially when selecting the best student, you bring the, the the smartest student to your department or to your university, which will enhance scientific production of your university. But be, behind this, at the country level. You know that if someone graduate or spend some time in a given country, uh, at a given university, since we are selecting the, the, the best one, the smart one that will have you know, bright future, it can be considered as your future ambassador, okay? Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes, it, it goes beyond just the institution. So maybe while we're talking about institutions, let's pivot to um, Professor Mbaye, who comes from an African host institution. And I kind of, Professor Mbaye wants to pose a, a fairly similar question to you, right? So it's clear or easy to understand how the individual scholars who participate in this program benefit, right? They're, degrees are enriched, their own life experiences and professional connections are enriched. But this past at RSIF program is ultimately a program focused at building institutional capacity or capacity, as Professor Chibuni noted, for the country or the region. So Professor Mbaye, can I ask that you um, reflect a little bit maybe about how your, your home institution, um, Gaston Berger, benefits from participating in this program, in addition to the individual scholars who participate in the program. Mm. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Andrés. Uh, alors, la, la, la question, elle est, uh, elle est très interessante. It's very interesting. Uh, um, parce que, La collaboration a apporté ou notre institution a apporté 
three, three, three benefits that I noted. The first was diversity of collaboration, of research collaborations. Before PASET and uh, before PASET asset program, our collaboration was uh, mainly directed towards France. And uh, so geographically, it was directed to the French speaking world. But with uh, the PASET ARCIF uh, program, it opened our collaboration space, uh, first and foremost uh, towards uh, the United States and then towards uh, Japan with the University of Tokyo. And even if they are not IITI, uh, South Africa. And uh, the most important, uh, African host universities discussed themselves within Africa how we can collaborate uh, with each other. So that was the first point. The second point was the means of research and for, ex for experiments. Even if the student is going, we leave, uh, this is capacity that is going to remain. So I have uh, used my salary to pay a publication. Uh, but with this scholarship, we can be able to uh, carry out more publications. Because publications are not always linked to the capacity to do research, but also linked to the means that we have to be able to make these publications. So uh, the facet activity was uh, very useful in that. The third that I'm going to stop on is, is the pathway towards uh, standards, uh, university standards, at attaining certain university standards. And uh, the uh, PASET RSIF program uh, helped us to have a scoping meeting so as to compare the, 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 the PhD standards uh, among universities. And so we were able to see what are our differences And when we went to the universities, the IPI universities, we were able to see what their standards are, which are different from ours. And this exchange was very, very, very important for us in positioning ourselves uh, in relation to the, uh, the international universities. De, de pouvoir donner des réponses. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so so thank you to the the Parset people for having organized um, interpretation for us. That's really useful. As um, Ms. Mahina also pointed out at the beginning, language is sometimes a barrier, right? And that certainly is true if one works in a place that's, that's multilingual as as Africa. So for the audience, remember that you can get translation, the right hand bottom of the screen. If you click there, you can select translation into English, French or Portuguese. You can mute the original audio so that you only hear the translator's voice. Sometimes that helps. Um, but yeah, it's technology. Sometimes it doesn't work as well as it, as it should. Um, something that strikes me by listening to, to both professors Chabuni and Mbaye here is both of them talked in a sense about a way of diversifying the voices on their campus, right? Um, either through, for instance, adding students from Africa to campuses elsewhere, um, which might not often have African students. But then Professor um, Mbaye also mentioned about how their collaboration expanded beyond Fra Francophone Africa and francophone, you know, the French speaking part of Europe through this program. So th there is this drive in higher education to internationalize, right? So I think there's many different ways in which we can get there. Programs like this, I think can take us a long way towards that. Um, but maybe let's move on to um, some of our other panelists. So we've, we've heard a little bit about the 
the benefits that the African Host University or the international partner institution can get from collaboration in a program like this. But let's um, direct the attention to some of the industry partners in the program. Um, so this is a question going to our panelists from Nestle, Ethel Swanepoel and Donovan Hutton. Either or both of you can respond. So for those of us involved in higher education, and I think that's most of the people on this um, panel here today, we often hear that we are in academia in the proverbial ivory tower and that universities will only live up to their social responsibility if we leave those hallowed halls of academia and engage with real life um, issues in industry, in government, in civil society. Um, and in this way, for academia to engage with partners like you, you know, we benefit, right? Because we, we leave that protection of the academic setting. But what I'm wondering is if you can reflect a little bit from your side, right? So I know what universities benefit from this engagement. What is the benefit to industry for engaging with higher education universities in this type of um, academic mobility program. So I guess it's the same question as I posed to the other two panelists, right? So how do you go about convincing the CEO of your company that this is a place where we should spend energy and capital on? Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll field this one. I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a bit, uh, a bit harsh on academia, you know, um, just uh, uh, being sort of in their hallowed halls. I do think there's a very important role to play, of course, from both sides. Yeah, um, I think from a Nestle perspective, um, you know, we believe that uh, this sort of strong partnership, as Dr. Professor Cheboni also pointed out, it's really a win-win situation. You know, so as uh, in this partnership, I think you know the industry can drive innovation and enable growth in technology, of course. Um, but also in doing so, I think we can provide and offer real world solutions, um, you know, for the many challenges that we face globally, but I think also particularly in Africa, you know, so uh, the opportunity to partner with uh, PASET, RSIF, I don't think is a difficult sell to our CEO, um, you know, in that we are contributing to providing students with exposure to industry, uh, while at the same time, we get access, you know, to the, these really sort of great thinkers in the scientific arena um, and access to young talent that comes up with new innovative ways of doing things. Um, you know, so for us, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's a win-win situation, not a difficult conversation. And I think companies today um, cannot you know, ignore the fact that they have a bigger contribution to make. And I think Nest for Nestle, it's exactly the same. We, we want to um, see how we can contribute broader than just, you know, to, con to a consumer base. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to society and, and to the communities in which we find ourselves. Yeah. And also from a sort of technical aspect as well. If you think of a Nestle at board. the moment, we don't get your sound, we just see your mouth moving. Oh, okay, is it coming through? Okay, you hear me okay? No, um, I don't know, it's not It's not coming through. I think, uh, Andres, check your side. I we can hear Donovan, we can hear you. Mm. Okay, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's let's move. Oh, I, I I see in the chat that other people say they can hear you. So maybe it's just me who can't hear you. So yeah, um, to... please, you know, go ahead and answer your question. Oh, Sorry now about I can that. Hear you. Sure. Here we go. Thanks. But you can see me. <laughs> I can see you yeah. and hear you. So please. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. That's where sort of touch on the more technical aspect of how it fits into um, our organization. So we roughly got sort of 450 factories around the world. And although, you know, with that size of organization, we've got R&D centers all, all around the world as well. So, I mean, things are pretty much standardized, but what you'll find is factories are still <coughs> unique. You know, the environment they operate in or the design of the plant itself, 
some of them are old factories, like the oldest factory we have in South Africa is almost approaching 100 years old. It's um, Escort Factory, which was established in 1927. So that, that plays a part in you know, how we operate. So you've got unique problems on the site. And that's where we're, helping, uh, we, we're hoping our collaboration with um, OSIF will benefit us, is that you come with fresh eyes, look at our, our factory, yeah, and on a more specific issue we may have. So that's where we're really hoping the collaboration will pay off, and I'm sure it will. That's really why we're involved. Thank you. I, I can, since, since we have a relationship with OCP, the mother company, I can add one, one point uh, regarding the interest of the industry to be involved with such program. Basically, uh, an industry that it, it is not doing research and development, its future is its future is not is not good. <laughs> okay, I mean, the, the company who is not in into uh, research and development will fade away at one time in what time on. So. The interest of the company is to try to anticipate tomorrow technological solution with a minimum cost. Because if you hire, you know, consulting company, you are not sure that you will get the state of the art <laughs> science. Because you know, unfortunately, a lot of consulting company company are just making you hated technology, not not new. <laughs> But by investing little money in a university, in a smart kids, or at the university, you may you may hit the jet the, the, the jackpot because you will anticipate your 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 future technological challenge with the minimal costs. This is some of the interests that can be of the private company. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. And yes, if anybody else also couldn't hear the English speaker as I did, that was because I had the original language muted on the interpretation. So unmute that, and then you were able to hear the, the original presentations. So some things that I've heard from both our university and industry partners now is social responsibility, right? We as universities have a responsibility, so does industry. I have also heard how our university um, colleagues talk about, um, you know, how engaging with industry gives a fresh perspective, helps them think differently. And then we've heard the same from industry, right? How the academics bring a new eye or a different view. So it does seem as if the benefits is actually quite comparable in, in both directions. Um, but I, I want to pivot again a little bit and pose a question to Ms. Johnson from the Carnegie Corporation. Um, so you've been involved in higher education in the African sphere for a long time and your work as program officer, right? And you've seen many programs with similar goals to the SPASET RSIF program. Um, and you've seen which of these worked well, which didn't work. So I, I wonder if you can reflect maybe a little bit on what is necessary for a program like this to work and in which ways does the SPASET RSIF program, in which ways are it different and that might contribute to its longer term success or not? So just, you know, would like to, to get your, from all your experience, your perspective on this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so we've we we have funded a number of different models of both training, and also we found that one of the biggest problems that new um, you know, that new PhDs have. Is, is sustaining their, their uh, not away from doctoral training, but also into the postdoctoral and early career space, figuring that it takes a decade or more to, to really build a good solid researcher and also to get them 
up in the ranks enough, that they're earning enough, that they want to stay in, in our case, in academia, because higher education really is our priority. I think uh, a couple of the things that this program particularly has going for it, I mean, one, it, it was a very extensive planning process, and it really did consult and you know, add design elements that were supported by the African institutions. That to me is a first and foremost. I've seen many programs that are designed outside the continent and then brought in and who wants to be part of it. Those tend not to be as deeply rooted. And so if you look long-term, they may not be as um, present anymore. But this one did start from the African institution. The other piece of this is that it's supported by African governments. And which is highly unusual. You know, the sustainability of any kind of program, you figure that, especially in training programs, there's always a need for, for contributions uh, to train new because people age out. I mean, frankly, they retire, they, you know, they move, there's always gonna be leakages. So uh, the fact that African governments are part of this process can help both in terms of sustaining the program, but also in terms of, as I, I uh, spoke of before, the retention. You know, if there's no investment locally in African research institutions, then the odds of retaining very highly trained people go down. And so those are two really high points I see about this particular program. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I couldn't agree more with um, everything you've said. Um, you know, one thing that is, is great about this program is the fact that, yes, it's designed in Africa and also financially supported out of Africa. Um, I do think that we, we still have to take into account and always kind of keep foremost in our minds that the historical context in which these things operate, right? So we have partnerships between equals, between universities or between university and industry as, as equals. But you know, um, being equal doesn't mean being exactly identical, right? So some some of the partners have more um, financial resources than others. So there is an inequality that's built into the system, and and we have to think very carefully about how we we navigate that to make sure that the center of gravity in terms of decision making remains in Africa. Um, and it helps that in this case, the program really originated in, in Africa, as, as um, Andrea pointed out. Um, so uh, a reminder to the audience, if you have questions for any of our panelists, you can use the Q&A function. But while we see if we get questions from the audience, I um, want to project back a question to Ms. Maina. I hope you are still on the call with us. I haven't seen you in the, um, the yeah, okay, there you are still. So you, you mentioned, and I think that was so correct during your opening remarks, the importance of the, the kind of cultural experiences that's, that's part of this RSIF sandwich program, where that's not just the culture of Korea, but the different institutional cultures and research cultures and academic cultures. So um, I wonder if you can maybe reflect a little bit more on that aspect, right? So what, 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 what surprised you in the research and academic cultures in your experience in Korea that's different from what you experience in Tanzania? And which of those do you think you might be able to take back with you when you go back to, to Tanzania? Um, in Korea, uh, one of the major things I have uh, experienced as um, a trainee is um, the, the kind of uh, discipline they have uh, when it comes to research and uh, the kind of integrity they have in terms of making sure that uh, all protocols are observed. For instance, if, if you need to like join a particular laboratory or do a particular experiment, you have to make sure you undergo 
do the necessary training or do the necessary uh, certification for you to access uh, particular uh, laboratories or particular methods of, of uh, your work. So that is somehow different in terms of how um, I observed here in Korea and how uh, it is in Tanzania. Because in Tanzania, you can get, um, uh, what I, I, I got is you can get your partner or your peer just teaching you a method and you go directly to the lab and uh, depend on what your partner or your peer has just taught you, which is unlike so here in uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. that yeah. that sounds that sounds very you know true to if i compare my experiences in the us where i've worked for the past 20 years to my experiences when i was working in south africa that yeah in the us we also have a much more regimented structure for things like safety and approval and that is something that i think yes um could be taken back to host institutions in Africa. But I think that also flows in two directions. I think sometimes if I look at the US system in which I work, um, there are maybe more controls than necessary. And sometimes that can slow down progress, right? So, so I think the, the cultural exchange, the, the learning of different academic cultures also can work in, in both directions. But a very important part of this program, right? It's not just about individuals going to develop their sobre indivíduos que vão fazer a sua pesquisa, mas também tem que ver com a cult as culturas de pesquisa na, na na partilha de ideias e a capacidade de aprender uns com o outro. Tem uma uma questão no Our students in the RSIF program supposed to be attached to both an international partner institution, so a university and to an industry partner or just one of them and won't this affect the time to completion for students so i'll answer this question and then our um, um, um colleagues from passet rsif if i'm wrong please correct me but as far as i understand it is not both right a student is matched to uh, uh, a partner for their sandwich program and that is you know can be a university or it can be one of these industry partners but it's not a requirement to do both, I believe. Um, so we have only about nine or 10 minutes of our time remaining. So I think I want to pose a question to all of our panelists, and then any of you should feel free to unmute and turn on your camera if you feel you have something to, to say to this question. So what I want to ask of you is to project into the future, right? Imagine five or 10 or maybe even 30 or 50 years from now. What future do you see for African higher education? Will PASET RSIF still exist? Will programs like this still exist? Or will the landscape look so different that you know we won't anymore have programs like this? So I guess I'm asking you to to be somewhere between realistic in terms of what you think can be achieved and maybe optimistic, aspirational, and imagine a future for African higher education that you would like to see and reflect on whether programs like this can get us there. So this is for any member of our panel who wants to um, contribute some ideas. Um, maybe I can uh, I can contribute on that. Sure. Uh, alors sur uh, uh, the, um, uh, on the future of uh, of uh, uh, receive passet. Um, for me, I consider receive passet like a program of readjustment of the the functioning of uh, doctoral studies uh, in research of research in africa and i and for me uh, if passet uh, succeed uh, is also in place for the next 10 years the african institution will uh, be have the capacity to raise funds and even manage their research 
uh, instead of being in uh, a, 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 like program which uh, force them to have a finan uh, central financing, so the African university be able to uh, finance uh, research activity by themselves. A past sector can continue uh, in under the South South uh, collaboration because uh, I think it's uh, it's an, an important aspect uh, in uh, our experience. The thinking we have for now uh, is that uh, we have to work uh, uh, in agriculture. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not the issue of going to a university outside uh, outside the country, but you find uh, a university within our country uh, where we can collaborate and work on uh, similar aspects. For me, uh, PASET is going to increase in strength uh, and uh, African host universities should be in a position to raise funds, develop research and consoli consolidate or strengthen the, the, the uh, PhD network. And uh, the RSIF PASET could be actually continue with this networking program so that the program can continue in the near future. And this basically for the maybe from 10 to uh, five years, uh, and then we can continue financing uh, thesis uh, in the near future. Thank you. That's a challenge for all of us. If PASET is going to continue, we need to make sure that we can secure funding for it and support for it. So a reminder that I just got from the organizers is that there's a short poll that we want to launch. So you can launch the poll at any moment now and then ask for all the participants here if you can just take a second to, um, to complete the poll. Um, so... Any of our other panelists that maybe want to project into the future and try to imagine African higher education by you know, 2050, how it might be transformed by activities and programs such as PASET RSIF? Uh, can I speak? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, depend on my experience, uh, I have a lot of... Uh, ability and knowledge, I feel knowledge uh, in Africa. So uh, for example, uh, we conducted uh, uh, seismology technology in uh, Ghana. And so they, uh, we work with uh, government staff, GGSA and the Ghana University, they can uh, install and maintenance by themselves. The, our seismo uh, equivalent is a high technology, uh, IT field, but they understand and they can install and uh, maintenance and they have a plan, they imagine future plan they have by themselves. So I think we uh, work together. Uh, we are a company and uh, company and uh, uh, university and the government work together. Uh, that is a uh, uh, transfer of technology is uh, easy and uh, they already get the technology and the installation maintenance they can do. So um, work together and discuss together is uh, uh, yeah. make yes. uh, future, future, uh, bright future, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those comments. I think they are exactly right that you know, collaboration is what's going to make our future better. Um, so um, our organizers, is the poll results available? 
uh, may I add one suggestion, please, about the future of this program? Yes, quickly. I yeah. mean, I, I, I really, uh, I mean, this program is great. It has to be reinforced and it has to be sustained. But at one point, several of the, if you think ahead, several of these students will come back to, to their universities and they, will, they might need some help in order to, because I know, unfortunately, I know the reality of, you know, research in Africa, but, you know, PhD students can do very bright dissertation with a lot of publication when he come back. The ecosystem is not well designed in, to sustain this activity. So what I'm hoping, let's me let's dream. I'm hoping to put together that we can put together the equivalent of National Science Foundation in Africa, which continue to support this initiative, but also to have it to have it uh, to have some research component, you know, continuous call of proposal component, and this can be funded by the African government, by the industry and some other donors. And I think that will help a lot Africa to sustain their, their research ecosystem and to make sure that research and education can be one, of, uh, one, one component to tackle the social economic uh, problem and challenges in Africa. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, I, I wanted to give closing comments, but I think those are about as good as we can, right? It's saying that, yeah, we want a, a, a bright future for Africa and what are the next steps, right? We now, once we have run programs like Basel RSIF, we need to make sure that the infrastructure is there on the continent to now support those individuals to have productive, successful careers. So we are at time. Let me say thank you to all of our panelists um, and to everybody in the audience. I'm happy to see the, the, um, the poll results. I'm assuming all of you can see it. So you can see where we all are from, the majority from Africa, and then we have a good representation in terms of different roles that people have. But thank you everybody for listening in. Thank you to PASIT for organizing this. And at this point, I'll hand over to the organizers to introduce the next presentation. Thank you, everybody.